Welcome to my tutorial for Crusader Kings 2. The goal of this tutorial is to explain the basics of the game so that you can get started as soon as possible. I will be breezing over a lot of the details, but if you're like me, you want to get playing right away and learn by doing. I'm not an expert player by any means, but I hope new players will find this useful. Crusader Kings 2 is a real-time strategy game set in and around Europe. You start out as a feudal lord. When your character dies, if his heir is a member of your dynasty, you continue play as the heir. If the heir is not a member of your dynasty, you continue as some landed member of your dynasty. If no one in your dynasty has any land, the game ends immediately. Crusader Kings 2 has no predetermined objective. The game continues until the year 1453, provided your dynasty makes it that far. A typical playstyle is to try to acquire as much land as possible. Let's play a single player game. I am playing without any DLC or mods. I will start in 1066 AD and play as Merchant of Mumu over in Ireland. To select Merchant, I click Custom Game Setup, then I click on his county to Wadenhamhain. Please forgive my pronunciation. This is a simple starting position, so it's good for learning the ropes. My goal is to take over as much land as possible by means of conquest. I click Play, then Start Game. I'll skip over the intro text here. The first thing to pay attention to are the stained glass icons at the top of the screen. These are basically warnings. When I hover over them, you can see tooltips explaining what they mean. My first priority is to improve my succession. You should always maintain a good line of succession. And as you can see, my heir is unmarried, so I'll start by arranging a marriage for him. I'll click on Unmarried Heir. The game just brought up my heir's portrait. If I hover over the portrait, I see that he's my son. Now I'll click the rings icon, Arrange Marriage. The game brings up the character select screen to the side. This contains a list of people my son can marry. How should I pick someone for him to marry? For our purposes, I will be looking for three things. First, I will look at everyone's ages, which are to the right of their names. I would like someone around 15 to 30 years old, because I want my son's wife to have children and leave him with heirs. Second, I want someone with good skills, shown to the right of the ages. If I hover over a skill, I can see what the skill is. A quick rundown. High diplomacy increases people's opinion of a character. High martial helps with war. High stewardship increases tax revenue and improves the character's ability to manage his land. High intrigue helps with assassinating and imprisoning people and with thwarting attempts to assassinate or imprison you. High learning increases the speed of technological research, which gives you upgrades. My personal preference is diplomacy and stewardship, so I will be looking for high blue and green numbers. Third, I want someone with good traits. The traits are shown below the skills. There are a ton of possible traits. You can see what they do by hovering over them. Some traits mostly just modify the skills, either by increasing them, decreasing them, or increasing some and decreasing others. For example, the temperate trait gives plus two to stewardship, while the trusting trait boosts diplomacy at the expense of intrigue. The skill modifiers are already incorporated into the skill numbers, so I wouldn't worry about those traits. But other traits affect things other than the skills. For instance, the lustful trait boosts fertility, which is often good for marriages. The chaste trait reduces fertility, so I try to avoid it. Also, the traits that have heart icons and are green or blue in color have a chance of being inherited, so you'll want to check for those. The good traits that can be inherited are genius, quick, strong, and attractive, so it's nice to get those traits into your bloodline. Based on all that, it looks like Sigrid would be a good person to marry my heir off to because she has high diplomacy. I'll right-click on that person's portrait and click Send. I have a warning telling me that I am unmarried, so I'll go ahead and marry. I click on my character's portrait in the top left and click Arrange Marriage. Again, I want someone with a good age and with good skills and traits. I'll go with Hedwig since she has high diplomacy and stewardship. You can also arrange marriages for diplomatic reasons, such as to get an alliance with the spouse's kingdom, or even to potentially acquire the kingdom if you play your cards right. But to keep it simple, I'm marrying for good skills and traits. 
Finally, I'll go to where it says Idle Council Members and click on it. Off to the left, it shows my council. At the right of each council member, it shows what I can have him do. In the interest of brevity, I'll just quickly give each of them something to do without going into much detail. The one thing I will point out is that I'm assigning my Chancellor to fabricate claims in Osrage. I'll explain what this means a bit later. I'll go ahead and unpause the game to give time for people to accept my marriage proposals. I do this by clicking the pause button in the top right, where the date is. Then I'll click the plus button a couple of times to speed up the game. Okay, they accepted. I'll pay for the wedding myself. I'll go ahead and pause the game by clicking the pause button again. There's still an icon that says pick an ambition. I'll click that, then click the thought bubble to select an ambition. I'll pick have a daughter. That way my character will try extra hard to have babies, and I'll have backups in case my heir dies. I still have a warning that says you can press de jury ducal claims. What does that mean? Well, first a little background. To see the map more clearly, I'm going to click on the shield button in the bottom right to change the map mode to realms. The map is divided up into counties, the smallest unit of land on the map. Each county is ruled by a count. Some counties are grouped into larger land masses called duchies, which you can see by clicking on a county and then clicking on the small shield at the top right. Duchies are ruled by dukes. Above duchies, you can have kingdoms ruled by kings. And above kingdoms, you can have empires ruled by emperors. Every lord has command over a certain landmass, but lords can also have vassals and lieges. A liege will take direct control of some of his land. This portion of his land is called his domain, but there's a limit to how much land a liege can effectively manage, so he delegates control of the rest of his land to his vassals, his subordinates. So for example, I am the Duke of Mumu, and my domain consists of the county of Tuadenhamhain. But I also indirectly control the county of Ermhamhain through my vassal, Ragnavald, the Count of Ermhamhain. The game says I'm the petty king of Mumu, and Ragnavald is the Earl of Ermhamhain, but those are just different terms for dukes and counts. Each liege has one or more vassals, and his vassals can themselves have vassals. Back to the de jure ducal claim. The county of Dismhamhain is legally considered to be part of the Duchy of Mumu. This guy Miradoc has managed to hold on to Dismhamhain, despite the fact that he is not my vassal. But since I am legally the Duke of Mumu, I'm allowed to take over Dismhamhain by force. The thing to understand here is that you can't just take over any land by force. You need a plausible justification to go to war, also known as a casus belli. This distinguishes Crusader Kings 2 from a lot of other strategy games. It's why, if you remember, I sent my Chancellor to Osrage to fabricate claims. He'll give me a plausible excuse to go to war over Osrage. It might take him a while, though. It's random how long it takes to fabricate a claim. Note that when your character dies, you lose all of his fabricated claims. Okay, now let's say I want to take over Osrage. First, I'll compare our military strength. If I click on my portrait, I see over here to the right that I have 1,227 troops. And if I click on the Count's portrait, I see he has 1,408 troops. So I'm not really powerful enough to take him over. Ideally, I would want, say, twice as many troops as him, or at least 50% more troops. So to get more troops, I'll hire mercenaries. But look at the top right, where it shows my wealth. I have 65 gold, which is pretty pathetic. I'll probably need around 400 gold to be able to afford the mercenaries. So I need to wait for two things. I need to give my Chancellor time to fabricate a claim, and I need to wait for some tax revenue to come in. I'll unpause the game. By the way, don't be shy about changing the game speed. The game is filled with periods of low activity, followed by bursts of action. I'm going to speed up the game. Here's a random event dialogue, which appears sometimes. You can read it and hover over the options to see the effects of the different choices. To keep this short, I'll just try and pick something as quickly as I can whenever these pop up.
I just skipped the video forward to when I accumulated 400 gold. Normally, I would address some of these warnings at the top, but for simplicity, I'm just going to ignore them. Now that I have a bunch of gold, and also my Chancellor has managed to fabricate a claim, I'm ready to go to war. I right-click on the Count of Osrage, click Declare War, select my claim, and click Send. Next, I click on the Military tab. I'll bring up forces from my domain by clicking Raise Personal Levies, so now you can see them here in my county. I'll also get my vassals to contribute some troops by clicking Raise Vassal Levies. Now I'll go to the Mercenaries tab and scroll down to find some cheap mercenaries. I don't want the North Sea Cogs because those are just ships. I'll hire the Saxon Band because they give me 1,693 men. They'll cost me 150 gold plus 12 per month so I should be able to afford them. The mercenaries appear in my county. The next thing I'll do is combine all of these troops into one unit. It's much harder to defeat one large unit than many small units. So I'll click and drag on the map to select all of my forces. Then I'll right-click on Tuadumhamhain to order them all to move there. Now I'll unpause and wait for them to get there. Now I'll click this button here where it says Merge the Selected Units. Next, I'll make sure the unit has three commanders with high martial skills, one for the center and one for each flank. It looks like the game already assigned some good commanders, but sometimes it doesn't assign any commanders or it picks bad commanders, so you'll want to check. Now we'll send the army to Osrage. Okay, now we're fighting, and you can see that both of our unit's troop numbers are going down because people are dying. Okay, I beat his unit. His remaining troops are retreating out of the county. Now I have to siege the county, so I just park my troops there and wait as they siege it. If I click on the county, you can see that it has a castle, a bishopric, and a city, so there are three things for me to siege. Also, you can see that I have more troops attacking the holding than they have defending it. This is a strict requirement for a successful siege. This bar off to the right of my army shows the siege progress. Once it becomes fully red, they've successfully sieged one of the holdings. Now watch this number here in the bottom right, 38%. That's my war score. Once it reaches 100%, it means I've won the war. It goes up the more I beat up my adversary, and goes down the more he beats me up. The war score is especially affected by who controls any contested holdings, in this case, the holdings in Osrage. It will keep decreasing if I fail to siege Osrage. Let me just speed up the game. It looks like his army regrouped and started counter-sieging one of my holdings. I'll finish sieging one of his holdings and then go get him before he finishes his siege. It says victory because my army successfully sieged a holding. Now I'll select my army and right-click my county to send them to his army. Good, I got him. And now my war score is 100%, even though I only finished sieging one of the three holdings in his county. Let's declare victory. I'll click on the war portrait in the bottom right. I want to offer peace, and since enforced demands is selected, I'll get to take over the county. Alright, I have a third county. I'm moving up in the world. Combat is partially luck-based, so if I had been unlucky, I could have lost that war. Now let's just disband our army, since we're finished. I'll click the Military tab, and click here where it says Dismiss Personal Levies, then Dismiss Realm Levies, then Dismiss Hired Armies. Long term, my next step would be to take over Dismhamhain, using the Dejeri Duco claim, and then I would continue fabricating more claims and taking over more territory. If you want to reduce the average time it takes to fabricate a claim, you should appoint a Chancellor who has higher diplomacy. To demonstrate this, let's go to the Council tab and click Appoint to look at my options. None of these guys has particularly high diplomacy. The problem is that I can only appoint people who are currently in my court, and my court doesn't have anyone with high diplomacy yet, so let's invite someone good over. I'll click Find Characters here in the bottom right. This is a useful feature. 
it lets you search through all of the characters in the world. Now I'll click search all and set join court to yes. So this is everyone in the world willing to come to my court. I'll click the scroll icon at the top to sort by diplomacy. Normally, women aren't allowed to be council members, so I'll right click on the man with the highest diplomacy and click invite to court, send. I'll wait a little while and he'll accept and come to my court. Now I click appoint and I can make him my chancellor. Of course, I could do the same thing with the other positions, invite someone with high marshal for the marshal, high stewardship for the steward, and so on. That way, my council members will be better at their assigned tasks. Alright, now I want to explain the domain limit. Up in the top right, you can see it says 2 out of 4. The first number is the number of holdings in my domain, the number of castles, cities, and bishoprics I directly control. The second number is my domain limit. If I go above my domain limit, I get tax penalties and my vassals start to hate me. But otherwise, a larger domain is better, because it gives me more tax revenue and levies. So I want to get as close to my domain limit as I can, without going over. I'm not currently above my domain limit, which is good, but let's pretend that I were above my domain limit. In that case, I would want to delegate control of one of my holdings to a vassal. I'll click on my character's portrait, and then click on the court tab. These are people I can delegate a holding to. My preference is to keep my vassals weak and docile so that they don't get in my way. I'll look through my courtiers for someone who doesn't have any land and doesn't have the ambitious trait. Conchabar looks good. I'll right-click on his portrait to bring up a list of actions, then click Grant Landed Title. I'll select County of Osrage, then click Send. Now he is my vassal, the Count of Osrage. Sometimes holdings other than capitals may become part of your domain. If I click on Tuatamhain and you look at the big castle at the top, you can see that the shield at the top left of the castle matches the shield next to my portrait. This tells us that the county's capital is in my domain. But if you look at the smaller holdings below that, the shields at the top left do not match my shield. Those holdings belong to my vassals, which is usually a good thing. If I were above my domain limit, and I had a holding other than a capital in my domain, I would typically get rid of that first. To do this, I would click on the holding, then click the button here that says Create New Vassal. The button is grayed out because the holding already has a vassal, but if it didn't have a vassal, it wouldn't be grayed out. Now let's look at how to change laws. I'll click on the Laws tab. Now a really important law is the Succession Law, which determines who your heir is. If you hover over the different types of succession, it explains them. Right now I have Gavelkind, which is my least favorite, because my heir doesn't get all of my land. I'll try to change to Elective Monarchy. All of the options kind of suck, but to me, Elective Monarchy sucks the least. Under Elective Monarchy, some of my vassals and I each get to vote on my heir. The problem is, it's grayed out. If I hover over the question mark icon, it explains that I can't switch to elective monarchy because one of my vassals has a negative opinion of me. What's going on here? Well, each character has an opinion of every other character. So if I go to my portrait, then click on the vassals tab, I can see what my vassals think of me. So for example, Olav likes me 39, and Rumen likes me negative 3. If I hover over the number, I can see why he dislikes me. Rumen has some cause to approve of me, for one, the fact that I have reigned for a long time increases his opinion of me by 9. But other factors offset the opinion bonuses. He dislikes me because I used his troops in the War Over Osrage, I have the Craven trait, he has the Envious trait, and he has the Charitable trait and disapproves of people with the Greedy trait. There are a few ways I can make my vassal happy, so let's try to do that. I'll right-click on the vassal and see how I can interact with him. I could revoke the title to his land and take it up into my domain, and then he would no longer be my vassal. This can be useful, but it's also a pain in the neck, because either he will declare war on me, or my vassals will all like me less. Instead, I'll give him an honorary title. Master of the Horse sounds good. It's a prestigious position without any real responsibility. I'll also give him some gold. That always makes people happy. I'll give him 30 gold. Okay, now he finally likes me. Let's go back to the laws. I'll click Elective Monarchy. Now some of my vassals and I elect my heir. I can vote for an heir by clicking here where it says Nominate. I'd better pick someone who's in my dynasty. Remember, if someone who's not in my dynasty inherits from me, then I won't continue play as the heir, 
so I will lose some or all of my character's land. I'll pick my son, that's a safe bet. If I go to the Realm tab, you can see that I can set the level of centralization. Higher centralization boosts my domain limit, so that can be helpful. In the Obligations tab, I can adjust the amount of tax revenue and the number of troops I get from my vassals. Another important game element is Guardians. If a child in your court between 6 and 15 years old doesn't have a guardian, you'll get a warning like I have here. A child tends to end up with skills and traits similar to those of the guardian. Each adult can be the guardian of up to two children. I'll click on the warning to go to the first child's portrait. I'll right-click on the portrait, go to Assign Guardian, click on the Guardian slot, and select a guardian from the list. I'm looking for someone with good skills and traits. Sigrid looks good. Before clicking Send, I'll check whether the dialog box has a warning indicating that the child's culture might change. In this case it does not, but sometimes it does. Your vassals don't like it if you or your heir has a different culture, because they see you as foreigners. I'll assign this person as a guardian, and then assign guardians to all of the other children. Another thing I can do is construct buildings. To do so, I click on one of my counties. You'll want to build in a county that's in your domain. Now I'll click one of the holdings. You can see that if I had the gold, I could upgrade the keep, training grounds, barracks, and so forth. You can also create a holding by clicking in an empty holding square, if an empty slot is available. I like to upgrade and create holdings when I have some money to burn, but I only upgrade if I can stay above 500 gold so that I have some money left over in case of wars. Okay, that's pretty much it, as far as the basics are concerned. You also have Intrigue, where you can assassinate people and whatnot, ships for crossing water, and Holy Wars for infidels' lands. You have Factions, where vassals can attempt to replace their liege or threaten to go to war if he doesn't give in to a certain demand. Sometimes the game gives you the option to create a duchy, kingdom, or empire, which is usually a good thing. Be sure to keep an eye on the stained glass icons to check if anything comes up, and read the tooltips and explanatory text to help figure everything out. Also, be aware that the game has its share of glitches. If you play the game in the same fashion as I just did, with any luck you'll become the King of Ireland. Crusader Kings 2 is a complex game, so I have only covered a small portion of the mechanics. Once you are comfortable with the basics, click the link in the description if you want a more detailed guide to the game. After starting one playthrough in Ireland, I recommend starting somewhere more interesting, so you can experience more of Crusader Kings 2. I hope you found this tutorial helpful. Enjoy the game!